Hello once again. I'm scientist John Morris Pendleton. Oh, they promoted you from chemist. We're now beginning a series of three exciting conferences about dinosaurs. Hey, I didn't sign up for this, John. I'm doing fucking one. That's it. If there's more than one of you there... It's just me, but what do you want? Uh, I'd like you to do me a favor. Let's let's just take a little, uh, a few moments. We're gonna, I'm going to ask you about uh, some 15 different questions. And if you're more or less agreed, would you raise your hand? In fact, how many of you have a right hand? Oh, good. Just about everybody. You're a regular comedian, John. Why don't you go do comedy instead of this creationist stuff? I mean, you get booed off the stage, but it's got to be better than this. First of all, how many of you believe that dinosaurs did not ever exist? I'm going to say me. Can we stop now? How many believe that, yes, dinosaurs did exist? <sighs> okay, you caught me. I believe that. How many believe that dinosaurs are extinct? Well, it depends how you classify birds. How many of you believe that dinosaurs became extinct about 65 million years ago? I'm not going to get pedantic with the bird thing, so yes, fine. How many believe that dinosaurs are good evidence for evolution? In context, sure. So as long as we look at all the facts, then yes. Are you going to look at all the facts, John? How many believe that dinosaurs are evidence for creation? Ask me again at the end of the video. We'll see how I feel about it then. How many of you do not understand the questions? Okay. <laughs> Stick to the pseudoscience, Jerry Seinfeld. How many believe that humans did not live at the same time with dinosaurs? That the humans lived with dinosaurs at the same time is what? I think you accidentally the whole sentence. How many believe that humans did live at the same time with dinosaurs? With dinosaurs at the same time as what? How many believe that dinosaurs are from the devil? Christ on a cock, man. Where did that come from? Does this have anything to do with your video, or are you just getting sidetracked? How many believe that the Bible does not talk about dinosaurs? Pretty sure. How many believe that Noah did not take dinosaurs with him on the ark. Are we allowed to believe that Noah didn't take anything on the ark because it never existed? All right, I do not believe that Noah took dinosaurs with him on the ark. How many believe there are no dinosaurs alive today? Pretty much. How many don't know what they believe? <laughs> What's that fucking snicker for you, piece of shit? If someone doesn't know what they believe, they should believe nothing until they're presented with evidence. That's what a rational person does, not like you. Look at you fucking laughing at that concept. How many are ready to receive very many interesting surprises? Wow. Daddy, does the bad man want to pound me? Gonna have a fun time. Not that. Anything but that. Now, not only am I a chemist and a scientist... Oh, a chemist and a scientist. Well, aren't you the Renaissance man? I'm also a magician. And I've got a little trick for you. Just when you thought it couldn't get any worse. This trick has a purpose to it. First of all, I'll impress you with the trick and tell you how to do it so you can impress your friends that aren't seeing this today. John, I'd rather shoot myself than do this trick in front of people. But the point of this trick is to learn an important lesson in life. Many times in life we receive or don't receive new information based on our previous experiences. And that's basically normal. But many times there's going to come new information thoroughly different from what we're used to hearing, what we come to believe, that is really the right answer, is helpful information. And if you don't have an open mind to receive new, beneficial information, you're going to lose out on a lot. Uh -huh. Now, in the case of this balloon and this sewing needle, we have the custom that the two don't mix. I know, you're going to put the needle through the thick part of the balloon at the bottom, and it's not going to pop because it's not stretched. I mean, anyone could figure that out without even thinking about it. Yeah, huh? Fine, have it your way, but I'm not watching your trick. I'm going to share a number of things about dinosaurs that you are already convinced that you think you know all of the facts. I'm going to bring forth evidence and information very different, but it's going to be helpful. It's going to be beneficial. For me, I see dinosaurs every place. For example, here's two of them fighting on the cover of a boy's magazine. You heard it from the man himself. Chemist scientist John Morris Pendleton reads Boy's Life. The Sinclair Company, a Hershey's chocolate bar. A couple years ago, I was in the United States, went to the post office to buy some postal stamps. They gave me a whole sheet full of dinosaur stamps. A bit ago, I was in Panama. Guess what? Down there, they're eating chicken nougat sarios. Then I went to my hometown of Zacatecas, went to a supermarket there, and Campbell's has even come out with 
a form of dinosaur soup. John, you seem to be implying that you took photos of these products when you were in these places. Now, I really hope that you're just making that up, because the alternative is either that you take pictures of every product you see, or at the very least, write them all down so you can Google them later. Of course, what else would I expect from someone who reads Boy's Life? So like I say, dinosaurs are every place. Dinosaurs are on several products designed to appeal to children. Mind you, by the way, when you talk about dinosaurs to your friends, say, do you know who made the, na made the name Dinosaur? It was a creation scientist, a scientist who believed in the creation of God. Therefore, God created the universe, QED, atheists. Yes, dinosaurs did exist. Frankly, John, I am shocked to hear you admit that. Uh, here's a dinosaur claw, and here's a fossilized, um, uh, well, that other thing of dinosaurs. I believe the technical term is shit brick. Everybody poops, John. Now, if in your family you have uh, a young child, a boy or girl, we've got a real novel idea to make bath time a whole lot more fun. No, please, no. Just go find a dinosaur footprint about this big, put some water in it, and they can have a fun time taking a bath in a dinosaur footprint. Yeah, John. That'd really get him clean. When he stepped in there, it wasn't stone. It was mud or dirt. Later it became petrified. Petrification only happens to organic material, you fuckwit. That footprint would be referred to as fossilized, not petrified. This is the largest claw they ever found. It measures about 56 centimeters long, and uh, it, they found just the claw and the arm, nothing more than that. They gave it the name the dinosaur <clears throat> of the sigh. Do you know what a sigh is? That's, it's, a, it's a curved blade that uh, people use in the fields to cut grains and grasses. Psi do not have curved blades, nor are they used in the field. Scythes have curved blades and are used in the field. Now, the thing I'm going to share with you next is some very important information about dinosaurs that you need to pay very close attention because it answers all kinds of questions, clears up a whole bunch of doubts. Of all the creatures that God has ever made, Dinosaurs are amongst, reptiles are amongst the few that never stop growing. The longer they live, the bigger they get. I've heard this argument before and I have two things to say about it. The first would be that reptiles' growth slows dramatically as they age. The second would be that snakes are exceptional for their continued growth throughout their lifespan. So one prediction that could be made for dinosaurs having been overgrown reptiles is finding overgrown snakes. But we don't find that. We don't find one or two hundred foot long snakes. Sure, we find large snakes, larger than modern anacondas, but because snakes continue to grow constantly, and you're saying that a simple lizard can grow into the size of a Tyrannosaurus rex, I would expect to find some two or three hundred foot long snakes. If you can find me Pythonosaurus rex, I'll become a creationist. Now, what is our authority? Have you remembered? It's the Word of God. We base all of our thoughts, all of our thinking is based on what God says in His Word. I can see you've extensively studied the part of the Bible where God's Word is <laughs> Before the flood, people lived an average of 912 years. That's an average, those are the years just like the number of years I have, the number of years you have. Years were exactly the same. There was a special condition. In fact, we have a number of fossils of known insects and other animals that we know today, but back then they were much, much bigger. For example, we have the uh, dragonflies, which today measure about four inches across their wingspan. Back then we have fossils of dragonflies that measured 12, or excuse me, six feet. Dragonflies stop growing when they mature. A rhinoceros, 17 feet up to its shoulder. Rhinoceroses stop growing when they mature. A beaver, eight feet tall, the size of a bear. Beavers stop growing when they mature. Grasshoppers, 24 inches long. Grasshoppers stop growing when they mature. And I'm sorry, ladies, girls, but we had cockroaches that measured 18 inches. Cockroaches stop growing when they mature. Everything grew bigger, lived longer before the flood. The question is, why? Let's go to our authority. Let's go to the Word of God. In Genesis chapter 1, it says, 
And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God, and there's two bodies of water. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. And so from this information in the Bible, we get this kind of a picture of the early earth. It was like inside a giant bubble of waters above the earth. This served for a number of purposes. One, it cut down, it worked as a shield against the harmful radiation from the sun. Ultraviolet radiation, x-rays, cosmic rays. It increased the earth's atmosphere, probably more than double atmospheric pressure. It made the earth like in, inside of a giant greenhouse. The polar regions, as well as the equator, had almost the same temperature. Um, also, <clears throat> we find from samples of amber, that's fossilized tree sap, you remember that from the movie Jurassic Park, we find air bubbles that test out with 35% oxygen. Now, oxygen is one of the naturally occurring elements that is one of the best antibodies that we have. They use it to purify water. You bubble oxygen through anything and it tends to purify it. And so, uh, just everything would live longer, grow bigger. The average size of a species is genetically controlled, John. It's not controlled by the amount of oxygen in the atmosphere. The amount of oxygen in the atmosphere affects a species' evolution, but it doesn't determine the size of an organism over its lifespan. Disease can stunt an organism, but lack of disease is not going to cause an organism to grow to monstrous proportions. Nutrition will help an organism to grow larger, but an organism such as a beaver that only grows to a certain size and then stops growing when it reaches maturity is not going to grow to 8 feet tall just because it has a lot of oxygen. If you wanted to make up some bullshit to support your creationist hypothesis, you could have at least stuck to reptiles and not mentioned mammals and insects. <clears throat> Tyrannosaurus rex had teeth that were almost <clears throat> 6 inches long. How would this dinosaur have been described originally. Now, how many of you say as a herbivorous? Eight herbs. I believe the word you're looking for is herbivore, and the definition is eight plants. This is the big question. What did the dinosaurs eat? Here we have six different teeth patterns of six different bats. Can you tell me which of these bats eats uh, flower pollen? Which one uh, eats small mammals, which one eats fish, which one just drinks blood, which one eats fruit. Can you tell? Insects. Can you tell by the shape of their teeth? Of course not. In fact, we have a bear today that has extremely sharp and strong teeth. Do you know what he eats? Meat? Wrong. The panda bear eats 99% bamboo. That's right. It has the teeth and digestive system of a carnivore, which is what makes eating bamboo so inefficient. That's why it has to eat so much bamboo and spend most of its day finding food. The thing is, though, that bears aren't exclusively carnivores. They're omnivores, and that's why they have the flat, grinding teeth at the back like we do. Now let's try an experiment. Give a panda a full mouth of canine teeth, and then let's see how well it does eating bamboo. Because that's what you're proposing by saying the T-Rex ate vegetables. And by the way, by teeth formation, what does this guy eat? Can you tell? People? He doesn't even eat bananas. He eats all leaves. You'd never know that by the formation of his teeth. That's why you need to study it. Now, Tyrannosaurus rex had teeth. They were about six inches long. They were long, sharp, pointed. What can we know for certain about that? That, judging by its size, it was able to ingest large quantities of food, and so that its long, sharp, pointed teeth were useful for helping it to eat its food, which means that its food must be that which can be eaten with relative ease with nothing but long, sharp, pointed teeth, requiring no grinding as plants do? Or were you hoping for another answer? We have to be good scientists. You also said very short roots, less than an inch deep. What would happen if he would give a bite to a dinosaur with thick, tough hide? He'd bite right through it, because you made that up. What dinosaur is he going to hold with these little bitty forearms that he's got? He's got two big-ass legs, a tail to balance on while he uses his foot to hold down his prey, and a big-ass fucking mouth. 
Are you kidding me? The forearms just don't get used, and so they've shrunk over generations because they're fucking useless. Like a whale's legs. In Genesis 1.30 it says, God says, And to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to everything that creeps upon the earth, and which is life, I have given every green herb for food, and it was so. Originally he was herbivorous. We have to be good scientists. All of our thinking is based on what God says in his word. We have to be good scientists. All of our thinking is based on what God says in his word. That little lion had uh, uh, a bowl of milk and some raw eggs and cooked vegetables, cooked uh, oats and some ground beef. Well, the little lion would eat of everything except the ground beef. The funny thing about this story is that I can't find anything about it anywhere other than creationist and vegan slash vegetarian websites. Now you think something so remarkable as this, which one of the websites even claimed is a scientific mystery that nobody has yet been able to figure out at all, primarily because cats apparently require taurine in their diets, which they claim is not present anywhere other than in meat would be of interest to someone without the ulterior motive of either converting everyone to vegetarianism or converting everyone to six-day creationism. And apparently this story originated from a book published by the Theosophical Publishing House, which was originally published by Via Taurus Ministries. Kind of funny that the group promoting this story is the group that's trying to convince everyone that lions used to eat vegetables. The book's name is Little Tyke, by the way, in case you want to look it up. And it shouldn't be a surprise, because God in his word says that one day, the lion shall lie down with the lamb. He also says in Isaiah, the lion shall eat straw as does the bullock, Isaiah 65, 25. And so it perfectly fits with what God says in his word. It sure does fit nicely, John. It's just too bad there's no documentation for it. And hell, if you're a crazy biblical literalist who wants to convince people that lions can eat vegetables, you can train a cat not to eat meat if you just beat it every time it comes near a piece of steak. Now, there's a display in the Cincinnati Zoo bird exhibit that says dinosaurs went extinct millions of years ago or did they no birds are essentially modern short-tailed feathered dinosaurs what are they doing they are <laughs> giving us a handy oh yeah <clears throat> brainwashing us well that's not nearly as fun tell me about this new menace to society now in 1998 national geographic published this edition their lead story was dinosaurs take wing the origin of birds now this picture on the cover is good artwork <clears throat> but it is not science yes i agree illustrations are not science did you actually read the words or can you only read picture books inside we have here the evolution of a wing anybody seen that no it's just good drawing it is not science again was there any text john if National Geographic is too hard for you, you could always go back to boy's life. And of the many things in there, it was all based on this fossil that was exported illegally from China. They say the bottom part looks like a reptile or dinosaur. The top part looks like the beginning of wings and proto feathers. And so it was all based on one fossil. As they did a little bit further study after publishing their magazine, they found out that it was neither a bird or a dinosaur, rather it was a fraudosaurus. Yes, indeed they did, John. And who was it who found that out exactly? Was it your creation scientist pals? No, it was the real scientists. If they wanted to convince everybody that it was real, why would they disprove themselves? Because they're scientists. That's what they do. They try to disprove their own findings. And sometimes they succeed. And when they manage to disprove their own findings, they accept the facts, and they discard the piece of forged evidence, and they move on. That's science. And the most funny part about this is, it's a National Geographic article. This was not published in peer-reviewed journals. This was published in National Geographic, a, a pulp science publication, if you even want to refer to it with the word science. National Geographic is not a scientific journal. It is not even in the same league as science, nature, or paleontology journals. So to cite National Geographic and say that the entire scientific community is trying to brainwash you, when not only did no science journals publish this finding, but the scientists actually disproved it and made that finding public. It's about the most dishonest thing you could possibly do. You know, all the fossils we have of dinosaurs are 100% dinosaur. There is a, not a single fossil that shows some animal becoming a dinosaur 
or a dinosaur changing into some other animal. the creator. God bless you, and we'll see you soon. Oh no, you won't see me soon. But maybe someday, you lying bastard. Yeah.